For most of my life, Friday the 13th Part 3 was my favorite of all the Jason Voorhees exploits. It had a wonderful set of characters that genuinely felt like friends. And that Jason look. Boy, oh boy, do I love that Jason look. He's this hulking brute that looks like he could start for the Dallas Cowboys. Then when we finally get to see that grotesque face, ah, what a thing of absolute beauty. Plus, I mean, this is the film where Jason gets his famous hockey mask. So join me on today's Real Slashers as I get into all of Jason's machete-wielding 3D exploits in Friday the 13th Part 3. Like most Paramount-era Friday films, Part 3 begins with a recap. Or, well, I guess I should say that they just chopped the final couple minutes off of the film before it and slapped it onto the beginning here, because that's all it feels like. Guess they were really worried about runtime. But for those that skipped out on Part 2, I suppose this gives you a nice reminder of where we left Jason off. We'll just ignore the fact that his appearance changes drastically overnight. So finally, at the 7 minute and 50 second mark, we're treated to some new footage, and we get this great opening scene at a grocery store. I'll save it for slicing up a scene, but it's fantastic. Harry Manfredini returned to score the film, and it's got one awesome disco soundtrack. I mean, just listen to this. From there, we meet our cast of characters. Chris, Debbie, Andy, Shelley, Vera, Chili, and Chuck. There's also Rick once we get to the cabin itself. These are some of the most likable people we've ever gotten in a Friday the 13th film. They actually feel like real human beings, despite some of them just looking like walking stereotypes. And I'm not sure there's a single horror fan out there that didn't relate to Shelly. Why aren't you down at the lake with everybody else? Well, they said they were going skinny dipping and... Uh... I'm not skinny enough. Hell, you're going to notice that a lot of the clips I'm using are lines from Shelly, because he's just full of awesome quotes. The group of friends is heading to Chris's cabin for a weekend getaway. While I'm sure you know how this goes, it's surprising where they take it. Chris had trauma when she was younger, and it's implied that she was harassed by some unknown assailant in the woods. I think we know who that is. Whether this was rape or not has been hotly debated, but the actress is adamant that it was not. Still, it gives our final girl a bit more meat to her story. One strange aspect of Part 3 is the inclusion of these bikers. They are essentially just here to cause trouble. They harass Shelly at the convenience store and then find out where they are and steal their gas. I like that it's a believable way to strand them but then they show just how inept they are as they get picked off one by one. Except for Ali. Ali is the badass amongst all badasses. He seemingly gets off by Jason, only to come back later, save the day, and promptly get finished for his efforts. His fearlessness makes him absolutely iconic. As expected, Jason takes out all of the young adults until there's just Chris left. She puts up quite the fight, too, as she's trying to escape from his clutches. And I love how much Jason feels like a creepy weirdo here. He even taunts her, taking his mask down to show her his grotesque face. She's able to seemingly kill Jason, but it wouldn't be Friday the 13th without some weird dream sequence ending. And here is no different. Chris thinks she's won, only to see Jason back up at the house, coming towards her. But then he disappears. Chris is clearly just seeing things. Only for little old Pamela Voorhees to pop out of the water, Friday Part 1 style. She drags her under, only to reveal that this is of course a dream. And Chris is taken into the back of a cop car as she laughs hysterically. She has lost her marbles. So much for a triumphant ending. Jason Voorhees is an absolute icon, and we've covered him several times, both on this channel and in this series. So I'm going to focus entirely on the version of Jason we get in Part 3, because this guy is an animal. 
This hulking brute was played by Richard Brooker, who sadly passed away in 2013. There's a playfulness to Brooker's Jason that I think is lost in many of the films. He's almost like a dog playing with his meal. And Jason sure gets up to no good here, as he tallies up 12 different kills during the runtime. While we're just short of the fabled number 13, we can maybe count Paul during the recap at the beginning if you're wanting to get that kind of idiosyncrasy. And there's some pretty good kills too, with Andy's upside down chop to the groin being a personal favorite. I mean, yikes. Then there's Rick who gets squeezed so hard his eyeball pops out. The effects leave a bit to be desired, but they're still so much fun. I'd still say that the most brutal kill of them all is poor Debbie. Reminiscent of Kevin Bacon's death in the first film, Jason shoves a machete up through Debbie's chest. But what makes the kill so brutal is the fact that earlier in the movie, they reveal that Debbie is pregnant. Wait, there's our 13th. A uh, little bit morbid, but eh, what the hell. Hey, hey, look, I'm eating. <laughs> they fly eggs. <laughs> there are so many memorable scenes in this film, yet I'm always drawn to the opening. The steady cam shot as it lowers to the local grocer is always a welcome sight whenever I throw this movie on. But it's the mystery that makes the scene so great. There's a hint of Jason here or there, but they're mostly hiding him in the shadows. While they tend to get away with showing him a ton in the third act, they're smart about keeping him to the shadows here at least. Hell, we even get a full-blown shot of him, but it's so far away that it's hard to even make out what's being seen. Didn't I feed you enough for supper? The doctor said you have to lose weight now, didn't he? But what makes the scene so memorable is the inclusion of Harold and Edna Hockett. Edna is such a raging bitch, and Harold is such a doof that it makes for a fun dynamic. I remember vividly waiting for Edna to get what was coming to her, only for poor Harold to get taken out first. Talk about conflicting emotions. Edna goes to investigate. <laughs> the kills may feel a little random here, but hey, otherwise we wouldn't be seeing another death for almost an hour, so I'll take it. God damn it, Shirley, why do you always have to be such an asshole? I beg your pardon, I'm not an asshole, I'm an actor. Same thing. Friday the 13th Part 3, released in the United States on August 13th, 1982. Wow, could you really ask for a better Friday the 13th release window than that? Fans clearly agreed because it brought in over $9 million on its opening weekend. It would end its worldwide tally at $36 million. Whether or not this increase in box office was due to the 3D gimmick, or just more people wanting some slasher chaos, Friday Part 3 was a hit. Unsurprisingly, the film holds a 7% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Wait, I'm sorry, what? I know, I know, this is just a score aggregator, but it really makes you realize how far horror films have come along since then. Because even with its faults, there's no way in hell that this is a 7% movie. I mean, 8 at least. Oddly, there are actually two different novelizations of the film out there. One was published in 1982 and written by Michael Avalon. This was released at the same time as the film. Then six years later, we received another adaptation written by Simon Hawk. Hawk had written the novelizations for 1, 2, and 6, so I guess they were trying to get a little bit of continuity there. Both are fun collector's items. And while it may not be a collector's item quite yet, the film was included in the incredible Shout Factory Blu-ray set. This includes a 3D version of the movie. Sadly though, this isn't the old school blue and red 3D. We also received an incredible limited edition steelbook for the movie's 40th anniversary. God damn, 40 years, where did the time go? There's just so much to love when it comes to this movie. The cheesy 3D gimmick and all of the lunging at the camera stuff is such a wonderful time capsule. And it's hard not to love the movie where Mr. Voorhees finally starts to look like the Jason that we all know and love. Add some wonderful characters and a cozy vibe, and you've got one of the better Friday the 13th sequels. What do you think of part 3? Where would you rank it amongst the Friday the 13th films? 
I would personally put this right near the top, but that's just me. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. What is a dream? They say it's a window into the subconscious, a vast, never-ending realm where one's decisions and ideas can manifest into whatever may be desired. Like a shark hunting in the deep blue sea, the dream world has its own unique predator, a monster, murderer, and child molester. Its name is Frederick Charles Kruger. We have touched upon Pinhead, Jason Voorhees, Candyman, and Leatherface here on The Black Sheep, but it's time to once again delve into one of the classics with an entry from the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Now, besides the original, Dream Warriors, and A New Nightmare, any one could be argued as the Black Sheep, but I'd like to take a path far less traveled and argue the inarguable with Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. This may seem controversial, but there really isn't a bad Elm Street film. Sorry, there's not. Elm Street at its worst becomes campy fun with an interesting visual dream aesthetic compared to the competition. And Freddy Krueger doesn't have a Hellraiser Revelations, Halloween Resurrection, or Jason Goes to Hell type of entry. Now, let me make this completely clear. I come from a Voorhees family. <laughs> But even I can't deny the consistency. From 1984 till its end in 91, New Line Cinema put out six Nightmare films in seven years. We can call that time the Kruger boom. And for New Line, Freddy Krueger was their Credence Clearwater revival of horror. I see the moon A decade into the rise of MTV, Freddy was, well, cool. He had become the Fonz of Elm Street. And Freddy's dead? continued with that same make and model. A lot of backlash had come from overexposure. Wacky Freddy had worn thin, but New Line doubled down and made one of the craziest goddamn films from a major horror franchise that I have ever seen. We start off in Springwood, Ohio, set the future of 1999. We are introduced to our unnamed teen protagonist. You know, mid-twenties. He is the last child in Springwood, and the town itself has sort of self-destructed. Kruger's terror has not only left the town childless, but has driven it into hysteria and madness. There are classrooms going on with no students, a carnival with no kids, yet the adults left in town have no bearing on reality. The journey is getting Freddy's daughter Maggie, yeah, he has a daughter here, who runs a troubled youth center back to Springwood. They are both on a collision course of destiny. If you lay the plot out, it's pretty grim and an interesting watch with a tone being contradictory to the actual plot. Freddy's Dead is presented as a fourth wall breaking cartoon. This isn't quite meta, but it's the most self-aware of the series. This is usually pinpointed as its biggest flaw, but I'd like to argue it's a delight if you can view it as is. This film is its own beast. We get actual shots that were taken and filmed like old school Looney Tunes. With the body outline cut from the dream realm, Kruger pushing a bed of nails like a severely burned Wile E. Coyote, to Spencer bouncing around to an actual cartoon sound effect. It's pure gonzo, and one you may need to fully accept to enjoy. It also injects campy, almost melodramatic elements. These intersect with the wacky surrealism the film sets up. This was the 90s, and it came out during the heyday of Twin Peaks, which was an obvious influence on the film. We're in Twin Peaks here. I'll tip my hat to the effort. But director Rachel Talalay didn't have the nuance or strangeness that Lynch conjures up naturally. There's a reason Twin Peaks The Return was considered groundbreaking, while something like uh, The Return of the X-Files? <sighs> Not so much. By the time we reach the end, with Maggie entering Freddy's dreamscape, it's clear. The inmates are now running the asylum. I do want to shit on the film for its tacky use of 3D, but I must admit it's, it's almost noble that they tried hard enough to make it relevant by writing it into the actual plot of the film. I gotta give them credit. This entire sequence is where Freddy's dead hits its stride. It was described as Mr. Toad's wild ride through hell. And yeah, sounds about right. We get the most backstory on Kruger himself, with the human side of Robert England getting the most screen time in the series. We see his murderous tendencies develop as a child. <laughs> The abuse from Alice Cooper as a teen, 
and the whole sequence of him murdering his wife and emotionally scarring his daughter. It's a series high point, yet it, it gets buried in the absurdity of everything else. This film is a time capsule. I always love how they brush off Spencer's pipe bomb. Life was very different before Columbine. Freddy's dead embodied everything that was the 90s, and the innocence that came with it. Freddy Krueger had a Nintendo Power Glove. We get a Roseanne and Tom Arnold cameo. Johnny Depp did an anti-drug PSA. All we were really missing was Chris Cornell drinking a Crystal Pepsi. We even get a theme song written by Iggy Pop. Freddy's dead. Not really the 90s, but I love myself some Iggy Pop. Unless he acts. Well, what's it gonna be, hero? I don't know what you're talking about. Was Wes Craven's new Nightmare Superior more of a proper ending? Yes. But it does not diminish the wild ride that is Freddy's Dead the Final Nightmare. To open your film with Freddy mimicking the Wicked Witch? To ending it with a fight playing out like an R-rated Three Stooges sketch? I am sympathetic to those who felt betrayed, but when you look at the whole catalog, you can acknowledge its absurd intent and love it for what it was aiming for. What started as serious horror ended as a stoner comedy with fantasy elements and black humor. I'm glad that something as ludicrous as this could ever exist. The freedom given to directors and writers with major film brands has become an antiquated idea. This film could never happen now, not in theaters. Franchise movies are shaped and boiled down in committees to reach the broadest audience. They play it straight down the middle as not to challenge or stray too far from what has proven in a lab to work. Freddy's Dead failed in a spectacular way. It was on a road to nowhere, but there's no other road I'd rather be on. Go big or go home. I'd rather you fail with heart than succeed with mediocrity. Kids. The Final Destination series is in the midst of a near 13 year break. But thankfully, that should be ending next year with the sixth entry in the series. But there was another time when the franchise seemed as good as dead. After THE Final Destination came out, it seemed like it was the end of any cheating of death. But thankfully, Eric Heisserer came along with a script that would blow audiences away. So we're getting into all of the gymnastics mishaps, terrible bridge construction, and massages with a not-so-happy ending as we look at what the f*** happened to Final Destination 5. A lucky few survived the disaster, and then one by one, death comes for them all. After the fourth entry in the series, Warner Brothers, having bought New Line Cinema in 2008, considered Final Destination to be donezo. At least, they did for all of one year. Because the head of New Line, Alan Horn, announced in 2010 that they were developing a film from one of the writers of the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, Eric Heisserer. I'm sure you're thinking, wait, how did he manage to book that job after making what is easily one of the worst remakes of all time? Well, his script here was killer, and sometimes that's all it takes. And I don't want to get into spoilers just yet, so we'll save the details of that for a little later. Steve Quayle was one of James Cameron's second unit directors on both Titanic and Avatar, so he was able to snag the directing gig. Not wanting to go for a typical naming approach, New Line Cinema announced that the film would be named Five Null Destination, which may just be the worst name in existence. Thankfully, they reversed their decision after some intense backlash. But what is Final Destination 5 even about? Well, we follow a paper company. Hey, they were really popular in this era, apparently, as they're going on a company retreat. But then things get all Final Destination-y when the suspension bridge they use collapses, and Sam Lawton has a vision of it all. While he's able to save them, death eventually comes for everyone that escaped the bridge accident, and it is ruthless. Casting of the film happened very quickly, with Miles Fisher being the first announced cast member. You may remember him from the American Psycho parody music video, which is an absolute banger. 
For the lead, Nicholas D'Agosto landed the part of Sam Lawton. And this is my opportunity to shout out Trial and Error, which is an amazing first season, and D'Agosto is in the lead role. Please check it out. Then, having been one of Jason's victims in the Friday the 13th reboot, Arlen Escarpeda won a role. The cast was filled out with people like David Koechner, Emma Bell, Jacqueline McCanus Wood, Ellen Rowe, and PJ Byrne. Now that's one Canadian cast. Thankfully, after not appearing in the fourth entry, Tony Todd returned as William Bloodworth, morgue tech who knows a lot more than he's letting on. And the franchise got a bit of prestige with Courtney B. Vance taking on the role of FBI agent Jim Block. I always enjoyed this element of the Final Destination movies, so I was glad that they brought it back. They also continue the trend of naming characters after various horror movie filmmakers. Candace Hooper is named after Toby Hooper, Olivia Castle is named after William Castle, then Peter Friedkin is named for the late, great William Friedkin. I'd say the names are a little more subtle than Cheney and Hitchcock. Unlike the prior entry, which had filmed in New Orleans, Final Destination 5 was filmed in its usual haunting grounds of Vancouver, Canada. The opening bridge collapse was filmed both on a set, but also on the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver. No relation. This was still in the midst of the 3D movie trend, so this would also be filmed in that format. But this would also end up being the first Final Destination released on IMAX. Taking the opening credits from the prior sequel, where we see the X-rayed versions of various deaths in the franchise, they've kept a similar look but grounded it a bit. Shot in camera, we get various objects flying through glass at the screen, and it makes for some very cool visuals. And YouTube is getting more and more stingy with the violence, you know, even though it's very clearly fake and from a movie, so I can't show you damn near anything here and I apologize. But let's get into it. The suspension bridge features a ton of visual effects and provides some really great tension building. It's interesting to see just how many elements in the sequence were CGI, because there are some that you might not expect. It's also the longest opening accident of the entire franchise. And shout out to Emma Bell, who had to scream her heart out during the scene, even when she's not a main feature in it. Maybe it's just because my stepmom is a gymnastics coach, so I've been around the sport for a long time, but nothing gets to me more than the gymnastics death. This girl has been set up as an absolute sweetheart, and they do a wonderful job of teasing all of the different things that could easily kill her. This scene is a great example of Quail's great eye. Especially the hands, because it's like ripping the hands or being on the bar when she goes from one bar to the other. So anticipate it. So you're on this bar and then her hands come into it and that's a cutting point. Many of the deaths in the film are based on real incidents. Isaac's death was based on someone who was getting acupuncture who fell off the table and one of the needles punctured their heart. Obviously, they go a bit further in the movie, but it's a moment that everyone can wince at. We just won't touch on the rather racist dialogue during the massage. Okay, I'm sorry, do you come with subtitles? Whoops. But this scene almost ended much differently, with the original intention that Isaac gets engulfed in flames after standing in a puddle of alcohol. Thank God for Buddha's inclusion. Olivia's scene was also altered slightly, while just one of her eyes is burned in the film, an alternate scene shows both of her eyes being burnt up. One visual trick that they used repeatedly was filming the real-life human in one shot with a dummy filled with all sorts of blood and gore in another take. They would combine the two shots and get some ooey-gooey results. There are also some pretty fun moments here, like Olivia knocking a picture off her desk that was taken at the Devil's Flight roller coaster, you know, the one from part three. Then there's Roy standing next to this race car, which just so happens to be the same car that crashed in the Final Destination. We've also even got the log truck from Final Destination 2 making an appearance. Heck, even the restaurant that Sam works at is the same one seen at the end of the first film. There's so many connections here. And spoilers for this decade plus old movie, but the aspect that really stuns is when it's revealed that the events we've seen actually take place before the infamous Flight 180. This is a prequel. 
But it's unfortunate for our two leads because the entire audience knows what's going to be happening to them in no time flat. But it's a great way to show that death never stops. And even the first film wasn't the beginning of this kind of thing happening. And it's also really cool to see the Flight 180 crash from a different angle. And it's great that we don't just have characters looking up these past incidents and immediately knowing what's happening. While sure it cuts down on exposition in the other films, it would have been very tired to do it again. So the change seems to work. One of the absolute best elements of Final Destination 5 is its mythology on how to defeat death. In past films, we've seen that new life can help, but for the most part, death comes to these folks no matter what they do. But this film introduces the concept of murdering someone else to take your place. It gives us what the Final Destination series has always been lacking, a human villain. Sure, they use Ian McKinley in a similar role in the third one, but he mostly taunts versus actually trying to kill someone. Here, Peter is an absolute maniac, having lost his girlfriend and obsessing over death coming for them. He even almost pushes a woman into traffic. He sees Sam and Molly's relationship and doesn't understand why they're deserving of happiness over him. It's easy to see where Peter is coming from, even if he takes some rather excessive means to do so. And I also love that the movie doesn't even confirm that this technique works, as everyone in the film ends up dead, even those who seemingly took another's life. Brian Tyler returned to score the film, and while Shirley Walker's style is certainly missed, I absolutely loved her, Tyler manages to bring a great deal of tension and suspense. The franchise continues its usage of on-the-nose music and suspenseful moments. We've got Dust in the Wind playing during the bridge sequence, and it's so perfect. Dust in the wind. Final Destination 5 released in the United States on August 12, 2011, and brought in $18.4 million on its opening weekend. The movie would end its worldwide run at $157.6 million. But with just 42 million of that being earned domestically, this was officially the lowest grossing entry of the franchise. But it was well liked, earning a B plus audience rating and cinema score, with the critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes being that it's still only for the gore thirsty faithful, but Final Destination 5 represents a surprising return to form for the franchise. For the movie's promotion, Miles Fisher released a music video called New Romance which featured the cast of FD5 recreating Save by the Bell, only with a twist. It's a fun video, and I highly recommend you checking it out. Another bit of promotion that ended up causing a stir for the studio was the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK, who banned the original poster as it was likely to cause fear and undue stress in children. Excuse me, what? Warner Brothers countered, but the ASA stood their ground. What say you? Is this poster too traumatizing for children to see? Unfortunately, despite a positive response and an impressive international box office, we're still waiting on a sixth installment. Tony Todd had even been hopeful of them filming six and seven back to back, but as the years went on, this plan disappeared. In 2019, Saw sequel writers Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan were hired to write a reimagining. But yet again, that never happened. But with Spider-Man No Way Home director John Watts boarding as a producer, and director Zach Lepofsky and Adam B. Stein on board, it finally appears to be on the fast track. Let's just hope that they continue to go hard with the violence, while expanding upon the mythology in an interesting way. I guess only time will tell.